Isaiah 65, verse 17. The Bible is an amazing book. The Lord used godly people to make predictive statements, and these are precisely foretelling events before they happen. That's what the Bible calls prophecy, biblical predictions. Prophets prophesying future events and their predictions coming true. With amazing accuracy, biblical prophecy is one of the primary reasons, look at me, that we know that this book is not the Word of man, it is the Word of God. We see so many prophetic words that were spoken, and they come true precisely. One of the reasons that I enjoy, have enjoyed preaching out of Isaiah over the last couple of years is that Isaiah was a godly prophet, and no one in the Bible spoke more prophecies about Jesus in the Old Testament than did Isaiah. Think with me and look on the screen. He spoke prophetically about Jesus' birth. Isaiah 7, verse 14, Therefore the Lord Himself will give you a sign. A virgin will be with child. There's Mary right there in the Old Testament. And bear a son. There's Jesus. And she will call His name Emmanuel, which as you know means God with us. Jesus was and is God with us. So Isaiah spoke prophetically about Jesus' birth. He also spoke prophetically about Jesus' deity, that He was be God in the flesh, 100% man, 100% man simultaneously. Isaiah 9, 6 and 7, for a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, the government will rest on His shoulders, His name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father. He is one with the Father and the Prince of Peace. There will be no end to the increase of His government or of peace on the throne of David and over His kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. Isaiah spoke about Jesus' birth and His deity as well. He also spoke about Jesus' childhood and His adulthood. Isaiah 53 verses 1 and 2, when who has believed our message? To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He, for he grew up, talking about Jesus, before him, talking about the Father, like a tender shoot and like a root out of parched ground. He has no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him. Jesus was just a regular looking human being, nor appearance that we should be attracted to him. Jesus had a childhood. He never performed a miracle until he was a 30-year-old adult, and the Bible prophesies about his childhood and his adulthood. And then Isaiah also speaks about Jesus' atoning death. These are some of the most precious verses in all the Bible. Isaiah 53, in my opinion, is the Holy of Holies in the Old Testament, that chapter talks about Jesus all the way through. And here's His atoning death, Isaiah 53, verse 3 and following. He was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. Like one from whom men hide their face, He was despised, and he did not, we did not esteem Him. Surely our griefs He Himself bore. How many of you know that God has borne our griefs Jesus has on the cross? And our sorrows He carried. And we ourselves esteemed Him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. He was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon Him, and by His scourging, by His stripes, we are healed. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to His own way, but the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall upon Him, to fall upon Jesus. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb led to the slaughter, like a sheep silent before its shearers, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. 
As for his generation who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people to whom the stroke was due. We deserved the stroke, but Jesus took our pain and our punishment. His grave was assigned with wicked men, yet he was with a rich man in his death. Those wicked men were the thieves on the cross. The rich man was the one who allowed him to use his tomb. Because he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. But the Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief, if he would render himself as a guilt offering. Isaiah prophesied. Oh, he prophesied about Jesus' birth, his deity, his childhood, his adulthood, and his atoning death. But did you know this? Did you know that he prophesied about Jesus' resurrection? Bible says in Isaiah 53, verses 10 through 12, he will see his offspring. After he died, he said he will see his offspring. Future tense. He will. Nine times he's going to say he will. He will, or eight times rather, he will prolong his days, and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. As a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied by his knowledge the righteous one, my servant, will justify the many. He will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will allot him a portion with the great. He will divide the booty with the strong because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressions. Yet he himself bore the sin of many and interceded for the transgressions. Jesus Christ did die on the cross. He was buried, but he will the prophet said, he will come out of the grave. And guess what? He did on that third day. Amen. Let's give him praise and thanksgiving. Amen. Now today we're going to look at another prophecy by Isaiah. And it's about the millennial reign of peace on earth, the 1,000 year reign. You say, what's going to happen in the end of time? This is what I believe. I believe that at any moment, Jesus Christ could come back to snatch us away, the rapture. Two will be in the field, one will be taken, one will be left. Two will be in the bed, one taken, one left. Two will be grinding at the mill, one taken, one left. It's going to be just like that, the blink of an eye. It could happen at any moment. That inaugurates the great tribulation, seven years of the worst tribulation ever to happen upon this earth. At the end of that, Jesus in the rapture comes for his church. Then the great tribulation will be celebrating with the Lord in heaven during the great tribulation on earth. And then he will come back with his saints at the second coming. And then he will set up his rule and his reign in Jerusalem. And Jerusalem and Israel will be the capital of the entire world. Do you wonder why the devil hates Jerusalem? Do you wonder why the devil hates the people of Israel? It's because that's where Christ will reign for a thousand years, and he will reverse the curse of sin. That's what I want to talk to you about today. We read about that in Isaiah 65, verses 17 and following. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former things will not be removed or come to mind. One of these days it's going to be so good you'll forget all the bad. But be glad and rejoice forever in what I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem for rejoicing, her people for gladness. I will also rejoice in Jerusalem and be glad in my people. And there will be no longer be heard in her the voice of weeping, the sound of crying. No longer will there be in, in, in it an infant who lives but a few days, or an old man who does not live out his days. For the youth will die at the age of 100, and the one who does not reach the age of 100 will be thought a curse. They will build houses and they will inhabit them. They will also plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They will not build and another inhabit. They will not plant and another eat. 
For as the lifetime of a tree, so will be the days of my people, and my chosen ones will wear out the works of their hands. They will not labor in vain or bear children for calamity, for they are the offspring of those blessed by the Lord and their descendants with them. It will also come to pass that before they call, I will answer. And while they are still speaking, that is, while they're still praying, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb will graze together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox, and dust will be the serpent's food. They will do no more evil or harm in all my holy mountain, saith the Lord. What's going to happen when God changes everything and reverses the curse of sin? First of all, when God reverses the curse of sin, we will forget the past. There are some things that we're just going to forget, and the past will be part of it. Look at verse 17. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former things will not be remembered or come to mind. Many of you worry about things that have already happened that you regret You can't do anything about them. Give them to Jesus and ask Him to help you forget those things that lie behind. Isaiah promised that God would forgive Israel's sinful past, and they did have a sinful, wicked past. He would forgive them for their idolatry, worshiping Baal, Asherah, and sacrificing even their youngest children, their babies, to idols like we do in abortion today. Peter referred to Isaiah 65, verse 17, in 2 Peter 3, 13. Look at this. But according to His promise, we are looking for the new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Isaiah and Peter knew that new heavens were coming. A new earth was coming. One day, mankind's former rebellious sinful past will all be gone. The ancient curse of sin will be reversed. Satan and his demons will be cast into the lake of fire. Jesus alone will be King of kings and Lord of lords. You can't elect Him, and He's not going to resign. Isaiah said that the Lord will create in that day new heavens, a new earth, Former things will not be remembered. All the sinful things from the first sin in the time of Adam and Eve until today, all of that will be gone. It won't be remembered or come to mind. God will choose to forget our sins, and He will help us to forgive and one another and to be forgiven of our sins. The cross of Christ, the blood of Christ will eradicate all of our former sins. David talked about absolute forgiveness and how it would be in Psalm 103. He said, He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is His loving kindness toward those who fear Him. As far as the east is from the west, so far as He removed our transgressions from us. I'm telling you, when you come to the Lord, God forgives your sins, and He casts your sins as far as, as the east is from the west. Isaiah also said in Isaiah 43, 25, I, even I, God says, I am the one who wipes out your transgressions for my own sake. I will not remember your sins. Isaiah 44, verse 22, I have wiped out your transgressions like a thick cloud, your sins like a heavy mist. Return to me, for I have redeemed you. Micah chapter 7, verses 18 and 19, who is a God like you who pardons iniquity and passes over the rebellious acts of the remnant of His possession? He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in unchanging love. He will again have compassion on us. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. You will, yes, Lord, you will cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. There's going to come a day where all sins are not only forgiven, but praise God, forgotten. When God creates the new heavens and the new earth, when God reverses the curse. We will forget the past. Don't you want? How many of you want to forget your sinful past? Anybody out there but me? 
I love that old song that says, My sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but the whole, has been nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, oh, my soul. Have you ever repented of your sins? Have you ever asked God to forgive you for your sins? Have you ever believed that Jesus died on the cross to save you from sin? Have you ever believed that He rose from the dead to give you eternal life? Have you ever believed that? Have you ever received Him into your life? Have you ever called upon the name of the Lord and said, Lord Jesus, save me. I am a sinner. I'm lost. Save me. And the moment you do that, He gives you the gift of eternal life. Has that ever happened to you? God loves you, and when He reverses the curse of sin, He will forget the past. Secondly, when God reverses the curse of sin, we will celebrate the future. Look at verses 18 and 19 in Isaiah 65. But be glad and rejoice forever in what I create, these new heavens, these new earth, this new earth. For behold, I create Jerusalem for rejoicing and her people for gladness, King David was the first one to enter into Jerusalem and take it away from the pagans, the Jebusites. And it became the city of David, the city of God, the capital of Israel. And for thousands of years, Jerusalem has been at the point and received worldwide interest. As I speak, there are some countries surrounding Jerusalem that hate the people of Israel. They long to see Jerusalem overthrown and Israel being taken control of by themselves. These terrorists like Hamas, they hate and they butcher Israeli citizens. But God loves Israel. God loves the capital of Israel, Jerusalem. And in the millennial reign of Christ, Jerusalem will be the epicenter of the whole world. And there will be worshiping, and there will be praising, and Jesus Christ Himself will be on the throne. That's what verse 18 means when it says, be glad and rejoice, not just now, but forever in what I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem for rejoicing and her people for gladness. And verse 19 says, I will also rejoice in Jerusalem and be glad in my people. God still loves His people Israel. To be sure, you cannot get to God unless you come in repentance and faith through His Son, Jesus Christ. Nobody, my own children, don't get to heaven unless they come through Jesus Christ. He is the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to God but through Him. But I believe with all of my heart that there's going to come a day when many, many, many multiple Jewish people are going to realize Jesus is indeed the Messiah, and they're going to come to faith in Christ, and there will be many people who are Jewish who are born again in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe that with all of my heart. There will no longer be heard in her, verse 19, the voice of weeping and the sound of crying. How many of you want to live somewhere where you don't have to cry anymore? You don't have to weep anymore. You don't have to mourn anymore. Revelation talks about it in Revelation 21, verses 1 and following. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there's no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle, the dwelling place of God is among men, and He will dwell among them, and they shall be His people, and God Himself will be among them. And He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. No crying in heaven. There will no longer be any death, no dying in heaven. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. No more limping in heaven. The first things have all passed away. And he who sits on the throne says, Behold, I'm making all things new. And he said, Right, for these words are faithful and true. Then he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha. 
I am the omega. I am the beginning and the end. I'm the first. I'm the last. I will give to the one who thirsts from the spring of the water of life without cost. He who overcomes will inherit these things. I will be his God. He will be my son. But for the cowardly and the unbelieving and the abominable and the murderers and the immoral persons and the sorcerers and the idolaters and liars... Their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. In our day, there are many nations, sinister nations, that hate Israel. And one of the reasons I continue to be grateful to be in America is because, by the grace of God, the United States of America supports the nation of Israel. If we ever stop supporting Israel, we will do it at our own demise. In the future, Jerusalem will be the epicenter of the world. God will reverse the curse of sin, and we will celebrate the future. Thirdly, when God reverses the curse of sin, we will live long lives. Long lives. Verse 20, no longer will there be in it, in that new Jerusalem, in that new Israel, in that new land, no longer will there be in it an infant who lives but a few days. No more sudden infant death syndrome for babies. Or an old man who does not live out his days. No short lives for any adults. In Christ's millennial reign, everyone will live a long, fulfilling life. And most people will live to be 100 years old or more. Verse 20 goes on to say, for the youth will die at the age of 100. That is the youngest among all the people in that day. They'll die. They'll still be 100 years old. And the one who does not reach the age of 100 will be thought of as accursed. Not only will they live long lives, but they will also live productive lives during the millennial reign of Christ. Look at verse 21. They will build houses and inhabit them. They will also plant vineyards and eat their fruit. Indeed, we will be physically active in the millennial reign. We'll be carpenters, some of us. They'll be farmers. We'll be vineyard keepers. And we'll all live long lives lives and will enjoy the fruit of our labors. Look at verse 22. They will not build and another inhabit. In other words, we won't build a house and somebody move into it. They will plant and they will not plant and another eat. For as the lifetime of a tree, so will be the days of my people and my chosen ones will wear out the works of their hands. Do you know an oak tree can live to be 100 to 300 years old? Did you know that? There's an oak tree in South Carolina called the Angel Oak. It's between 400 to 500 years old. It's older than our nation. Did you know that today less than 1% of Americans live to be 100 years old? Less than 1%. Men die younger on an average than American women. I looked at the CDC report in 2021. That was the earliest, I, the latest I could get. American women have a life expectancy of 79. American men only live on an average to be 73. But in the millennial reign, you and I are going to live two to four times longer than that. No medicine, won't need physicians, we'll have the great physician. No hospitals, no emergency rooms, no nursing homes. Most all of us will live as long as a tree. We're going to live at least a hundred years, and Christians need to understand a blessed day is coming. I, I know that now all we see on the news is war and death and sorrow and division, but I'm telling you a better day is coming. This world is cursed by sin, but Jesus will come back and praise His name, reverse the curse. He will reverse the curse. 
And when he does, we'll live long lives. Fourthly, when God reverses the curse of sin, we will pray and God will answer. They will not labor in vain, verse 23 says, or bear children for calamity. For they are the offspring of those blessed by the Lord and their descendants with them. One major characteristic of the millennial reign of Christ is that God, as I've said in the title, reverses the curse of sin that we see in Genesis 3. When Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden, God cursed everything. He cursed Satan, the serpent. Genesis 3, 14 and 15, the Lord God said to the serpent, said to the devil, because you've done this, cursed are you more than all cattle, more than every beast of the field. On your belly you will go. Dust you will eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. Her seed is referring to the virgin birth of Christ, by the way. He will bruise you. That is, Jesus will bruise you on the head, Satan, you shall bruise him on the heel. He will strike a death blow to you. Even though you harm him, he will kill you. The serpent was cursed. The woman was cursed. Eve, Genesis three sixteen. To the woman he said, I will greatly multiply your pain in childbirth. In pain you will bring forth your children. Yet your desire will be for your husband. And he will rule over you. The man really is the leader in the house. Always has been, always should be. That's not part of the curse, by the way. <laughs> that was already that way before he said this. All right. But the woman, the pain in childbirth, it's a painful thing. It reminds us of original sin. And then man. Adam and the earth itself will be cursed. Look at Genesis 3, 17 and 19 on the screen through 19. Then to Adam he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and you've eaten from the tree about which I commanded you, saying you shall not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Every time you chop a weed, just realize you put it there. Your sin. It's there because of mankind's sin. Every weed. Every thorn bush. Cursed is the ground because of you. In toil you will eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall grow. There was not a thorn in the world until sin came into the world. There was not a weed in the world until sin came into the world. Thorns and thistles it shall grow for you. But you will eat the plants of the field by the sweat of your face. You'll eat uh, bread till all of you return to the ground because from it you were taken for you are dust and to dust you shall return. In the millennial reign of Christ, God's going to reverse all those curses except for the curse against Satan and his demons. No more sickness. How many of you are looking forward to that? No more war. How many of you are looking forward to that? No more lying, no more cheating, no more stealing. God will supernaturally answer prayer. Look at verse 24. It will come about to pass, it will come to pass that before they call, I will answer. How many of you know that God knows what you think? Does anybody know that? Not only does He know what you think, He knows what you're going to think. It will come, about, about, come to pass that before they call, I will answer, and while they are still speaking, I will hear. God will anticipate your prayers in the millennial reign, and He will bless you and keep you. Christians who pray now are blessed more than those who don't, but in the millennial reign of Christ, God will anticipate our prayers and answer before we can even verbalize them. That blows my mind. But again, we're dealing with God, okay? 
The last thing is this, when God reverses the curse of sin in the millennial reign, we will experience supernatural peace. Everybody in the world wants peace. Verse 25 talks about the time when true peace will come to all followers of Jesus Christ. Look at the verse there, verse 25, the wolf and the lamb. Now those could be obviously actually speaking about animals. I believe there's a figurative part of that as well. There are a lot of people in this world that are like wolves and they prey upon the innocent people in this world that are like lambs. But in that day, everybody's going to get along, even the animals. The wolf and the lamb will graze together. The lion will eat straw like the ox. Here we see the restoration of the Garden of Eden. Before Adam and Eve sinned, there was perfect harmony on this earth. Wolves did not attack or devour lambs. Powerful people did not attack weaker people. Lions didn't attack and devour oxen. And in the millennial reign of Christ, animals won't attack and devour one another, and people won't attack and devour one. You won't have to carry, you won't have to carry a pistol anymore, all right? You won't have to have a loaded gun beside you at nighttime. You won't have to lock your doors. When I was growing up as a little boy, we never locked our doors. We didn't even know what you're talking about. Why would you lock a door? Now, we don't just lock them. We barricade them, don't we? We've got 15 locks on every door. Can't even get out. God will also continue to punish Satan and his demons. Look at verse 25 at the last part. Dust will be the serpent's food. The devil's going to eat dust. They will do no evil or harm in all my holy mountain, says the Lord. At the end of the millennial reign, Satan will be set free from the abyss. During that thousand years, he's going to be locked up with all the demons in the abyss. He'll be let out. And then the Lord will defeat him and throw him into the lake of fire forever. Revelation chapter 20. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding the key of the abyss, a great chain in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon, that's the devil, the serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he threw him into the abyss, shut the door, sealed it over him, so he would not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were completed. After these things, he must be released for a short time. Verse 7, when the thousand years are completed, Satan will be released from his prison. He will come out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together by the war. The number for, war, for the war, the number of them is like the sand of the seashore. And they came up on the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city, talking about Jerusalem, and fire came down from heaven and devoured them. And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are. Also the beast is the Antichrist. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. And all God's people said, Amen and Amen. Let's give God praise. When God reverses the curse, we will experience supernatural peace. We live in a war-filled day. We live in a tumultuous day. We live in a time where nations hate one another, and many nations hate Jerusalem and Israel. Some of those same people hate Jesus Christ and hate all Christians. We are living in the day that the Bible talked about. There are wars and rumors of wars. At any moment, the rapture could come. Christ could come for His children. At any moment, we could be snatched away. At any moment, the great tribulation could begin while we are with Christ in heaven. Seven years of chaos and carnage on this earth. At the end of that, Christ will come back 
and He will rule and reign for a thousand years. And I believe with all of my heart we will sing the song that David sang in Psalm 122 about Jerusalem. Let's all stand up and let's say it together. I want you to know how to talk when you get to heaven, and I want you to know how to talk when you get to the millennial reign of Christ, all right? Let's read this together. Read it with me and praise God as you read it. I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Our feet are standing within your gates, O Jerusalem. Jerusalem that is built as a city that is compact together to which the tribes go up, even the tribes of the Lord, an ordinance for Israel to give thanks to the name of the Lord. For their thrones were set for judgment, the thrones of the house of David. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they prosper who love you. May peace be within your walls and prosperity within your palaces. For the sake of my brothers and my friends, I will now say, may peace be within you. For the sake of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your good. How many of you will start praying for the peace of Jerusalem? Anybody? Let's give him praise for that today. Amen. Amen. There's a better day coming. It's going to be very dark, and it's going to get darker before the light comes. Dr. Rogers always said, it's getting gloriously dark. Gloriously dark. What do we mean by that? We know what this darkness means. It's not the end. Praise God. It's the beginning. Christ is coming back. We're gone. We'll eat that wonderful meal with Him for seven years. And we'll come back with Him on white horses. And we'll reign with Him for a thousand years. And there will be shalom, peace, all over the world. And you won't get anything on the internet. It will just be the Jesus net, all right? <laughs> It'll all be about Him. Oh, God, we're looking forward to the day when you reverse this dreadful curse under which we have lived since Adam and Eve sinned. Don't tell me. The Bible is not pertinent to today's issues. Oh, it speaks. It speaks a word of calmness in chaos and clarity in confusion. This word is the word of God.